Hi, everybody. Can folks hear me? Nod your heads. Yes? Good. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Angela Maria Kelly, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for American Progress Action Fund. So welcome to today's event entitled the United States versus Texas, Will the U.S. Supreme Court Decision Echo in November? It's my honor to introduce today's keynote speaker and moderate the panel discussion that follows. So as most of you know, the Supreme Court heard argument on April 18th on a case involving a challenge to President Obama's November 2014 immigration executive actions. These executive actions would extend protection from deportation, known as deferred action, to undocumented people who've been in the United States since January 1st, 2010, and who have children who've been born in the U.S. His actions would also expand the population eligible for deferred action under the current DACA program, a wildly successful program by any measure that just celebrated its fourth birthday. The President's November 2014 actions were almost immediately challenged by 26 states' attorney general, and they were stopped by going forward in a district court that put out an injunction that was then upheld by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. So we have five million people and their families and their allies, and we're waiting. No decision today. My heart rate has just returned to normal. But this is all against the backdrop of a presidential election where the Republican candidate dehumanizes newcomers day in and day out and many more. But it's, a lot, it's about a lot more than a court case or a constitutional challenge or about the president's authority or even a presidential election. It's about more than an outdated immigration system and a house run by Republicans that is obstinate and obstructionist. This is about a community of people in this country whose size is the population of the size of the state of Ohio, who, people who have lived here on average for 12 years. They are not accidental tourists. They are here to stay. And meanwhile, the undocumented do what we all do. They go to school and they make friends. They go to work and they form relationships with their coworkers. They fall in love, they marry, they pray. So this case is about much more than constitutional questions or legislative paralysis. Let me tell you who it is about. This is the best part of my job, guys. As a daughter of immigrants and as an advocate in the field of immigration advocacy for over 20 years, I've met a lot of people who are fearless. I've met a lot of people who have suffered loss and who've suffered, suffered separation from loved ones. I've met people with talent and drive and infectious energy and charisma. But I'd never met anyone who had all that in one person until I met Jose Antonio Vargas in the summer of 2011 when he had just outed himself as undocumented in the New York Times Magazine. I learned that day what the term game changer meant. So Jose Vargas is a writer. He wrote and won the Pulitzer Prize for covering the Virginia Tech massacre. Jose Vargas is a creator. He built Define American, a nonprofit media and culture organization. He's made movies. He's started movies. He's directed movies. He's the first undocumented person to have testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. He writes volumes of poetic prose, and he fills rooms with people like you guys wanting to hear his story. But mostly, he opens eyes and he fills hearts. And I am honored to call him my friend, Jose Antonio Vargas. Come on up, my friend. <laughs> I can't really top that introduction, um, which was very, very generous. Um, I have to tell you, in this five-year journey that I've been in, which is, it's been five years, um, Angie, um, and Maria Elena have been like compass. They're, they've been kind of my moral compass. They're the ones who kind of tell me that I have to stay on my lane, right? In the best possible way. Do you remember that conversation? Yes. Um, it's really a privilege. A wide lane, yes. <laughs> um, it's really a privilege to be here today. Um, in the next two weeks, either this coming Thursday or next Monday, uh, the Supreme Court will issue a decision in the United States versus Texas, a case, as Angie said, brought by Texas and other state states' attorney generals that have stopped the implementation of DACA and DAPA. 
And I remember when that was announced in November 2014, I actually remember being in Las Vegas when the president spoke of the executive actions and how in a room crowded with immigrants, undocumented immigrants and our families, looking forward to applying. And we've been waiting for almost two years for this. And let's put this in a greater context. As of today, while we await this decision, as of today, we are 28 days away from the Republican National Convention in Cleveland. We are 35 days away from the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. We are 141 days away from Election Day. And today, as we await this decision, we cannot divorce what has happened and what is happening from the shadow of the tragedy in Orlando. Uh, and I have to say, as an undocumented, gay, Asian-looking person with a Latino name, it's called being Filipino, just FYI, who graduated with a degree in, poli with a degree in political science and African-American studies in college, let me just say that I'm a little bit more than anxious. Um, I've been kind of getting up really early, pretty much every day, reading everything I can about this case and about what's about to happen. And let us not forget that this Supreme Court decision, which is arguably the most significant Supreme Court decision case on immigration possibly ever, impacting the lives of millions of immigrants and their loved ones, this decision is going to be announced during Immigrant Heritage Month, which also happens to be LGBT Pride Month. Ah, the intersections. And actually, in lieu of that, I wanted to show you this video that is one of the signature campaigns of Define American. We released this video last summer, last July. I'm coming out to show that we are your neighbors, your coworkers, your classmates, and your friends. I'm coming out because I refuse to stand on the sidelines while others accomplish change. I am coming now for my son so that we can be safe and together. I'm coming out now because the person that is me cannot be defined by a piece of paper. We must destroy the myths once and for all, shatter them. You must tell your friends if indeed they are your friends. You must tell your neighbors. You must tell the people you work with. You must tell the people in the stores you shop in. We must continue to speak out. And most importantly, we must come out. Coming out takes many forms, but it always requires courage. It's time. It's time for all of us. Employers, employees, teachers, students, families, neighbors, Americans, allies, to overcome shame, to overcome fear, to document and define ourselves. We are coming out to be seen for who we are, not only as undocumented immigrants, but as Americans. Come out. Join us. At defineamerican.com. So, oh, thank you. Um, just some context about the video. We filmed this video um, on the steps of the San Francisco City Hall, the same city hall where then Mayor Gavin Newsom married same sex couples in 2004 that led to the Supreme Court decision on same sex marriage almost a year ago now. Right? We shot that video in the same city hall where Harvey Milk was assassinated. The voice that you hear in the middle of the video, brothers and sisters, we must come out. That's the voice of Harvey Milk. And the goal of the video is to create a very clear line, <laughs> to me a very clear line, inevitable line between immigrant rights and LGBT rights. And this idea that what we're fighting for is more than politics, but really changing the moral fabric of this country when it comes to these issues. Um, as a gay man myself, I remember a time when Ellen DeGeneres was on the cover of Time Magazine, where William Grace was the number one show on television for six straight years, a time when gay-straight alliances were ubiquitous in high schools and colleges across the country, in the same way that, you know, the changing of culture around LGBT rights led to the change in politics that is exactly what also needs to happen 
with how we think about immigrants and immigration in this country. Um, so this is one of the signature campaigns of Define American. I'm very proud to say that Define American, when you go to defineamerican.com, which I know you will, it houses the largest and the most diverse stories of undocumented immigrants and our allies. That means we include undocumented white immigrants. I meet quite a few of them, <laughs> undocumented Canadians, Germans, and French people. Uh, it includes undocumented black immigrants, Caribbean, from the Caribbean, from Africa. It includes undocumented Asian people. The fastest growing undocumented population are within the Asian American community, and of course, undocumented Latinos of all nationalities and ethnicities. Um, I'm also proud to say that um, as the founder of Define American, I'm actually a job creator. Define American has 12 people on staff, one of whom is sitting right here, I'm gonna embarrass him. Julian Gomez, can you stand up? Uh, <laughs> he's actually our, he handles our campus college. We have a college chapter program. And I met Julian when he came out to me during um, a journalism conference in Florida. And he was wondering how I can get around the country flying without real ID. <laughs> uh, he is one of the 750 or so thousand undocumented immigrants with DACA, so he's able to work legally for Define American, I'm very proud to say, with health insurance because of DACA. Um, so he's one of these immigrants that, you know, are benefiting from this very, very important program. Um, the genesis of this video for us, um, mind you, like the coming out of undocumented immigrants in this country carry a tremendous amount of risks, right? Um, especially under the Obama administration, especially with the ICE raids still happening, right? But I have to say that one of the reasons why we did this is I had a conversation with a young woman in LA. I met her at a bus stop, actually, near USC, the University of Southern California. She recognized me because, I don't know, she saw me in Telemundo or something. And then she said, yeah, you're the Jose guy that doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> like, yes, that's me. And then I told her, hey, you know, we're thinking of starting this campaign, asking undocumented immigrants to actually come out. And I'm wondering, is that really something I can ask people, given how much privilege I have? I come out, it's in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. I get arrested in Texas for eight hours, it's breaking news on CNN. Most people aren't that privileged, right? Am I in, a, am I in this privileged position asking people to come out? And she said to me, actually, Jose, like, Everything this country can do to us, they've already done. They've arrested us, they've detained us, they've taken away our dignity. This we have to do for us. This coming out we do for us. So she's one of the women that you see in the video. Um, right after this video was announced last year on USA Today, we were approached by a young man named Uriel Casas, um, who also, like me, aged out of the DACA program. Uh, he's 35, he has a bachelor's degree and an MBA from the University of Maryland. He saw the video, contacted us, and said, I'm ready to come out. And he happens to be uh, a personal trainer to the stars. <laughs> One of his clients is Tony Kornheiser, a oh, pardon the interruption from ESPN. We talked him through coming out, got, got him and talked to make sure that lawyers are taken care of. We partnered with the National Immigrant Law, Immigration Law Center for this. Uh, and we got him an article in the Washington Post coming out. Uh, in the next few weeks, um, we have an undocumented Korean student, law student, who's in a pretty high profile position, uh, who's getting ready to come out. We're helping do that with him. Uh, I don't know if you know this, that one out of seven Korean immigrants in the United States is undocumented. One out of seven, right? But to put this into better context, we are not really coming out. We are letting people in, right? Um, I came out, my first coming out, was in 1999 during second period U.S. history AP class in Mountain View High School. Mr. Farrell showed a documentary called The Life and Times of Harvey Milk. And the end of the documentary, Harvey Milk says, if a bullet should enter my brain, let that bullet destroy every closet door. And I was sitting in the back of the class and I knew that I was undocumented, that I didn't have the right papers. And I knew that I was gay and I figured I couldn't be in the closet about two things at once to so come out of one of them. I decided the gay one was the easier one to come out of. So I raised my hand and told the whole class that I was gay. It took um, 12 years to come out of the other closet, this immigration closet, and it's five years ago this Wednesday that this happened. And this happened in the New York Times mag Sunday Magazine and we launched Define American. Almost 23 years ago, my mother in the Philippines put me on a plane to come here. 
to give me a better life. And as I keep as I keep telling people, my border, such as it was, was the Pacific Ocean. My papers, I learned later on, were fake. I actually arrived at the Los Angeles International Airport on August 3rd, 1993, and I have not seen my mother in person since. To me, and countless other undocumented immigrants, possibly reuniting with our loved ones, with my own mom, with my brother and my sister, uh, they only recognize me by the stuff that I send them every month. Um, that, that reunification rests on the Supreme Court decision. And let's be very clear, what's at stake in this decision is our families, which is what immigration has always been about before immigration became synonymous with wall, walls and borders. Immigration is about families. I live in Los Angeles, which in many ways is the epicenter of our country's undocumented population, a city of tens and thousands of families where immigration reform is not a political talking point, where DACA and DAPA are not mere acronyms, but in fact lifelines. I live in a city of immigrants whose colonial and imperialized histories cannot be divorced from the push-pull factors of migration. I live in a city where the people Donald Trump, Fox News, and the Washington Post, who I used to work for, call illegal is actually someone's mom, someone's dad, someone's brother and sister, someone's grandmother and grandfather. Upwards of 500,000 people in the Los Angeles area will be directly impacted by this decision. 500,000 people. That's larger than many states in this country. And guess what? Most of them, many of them, are actually out about their status. And one of the people, two of the people who are out, are Soyla Cruz and Raul Cruz. I don't know if you recognize those names. That is the mom and the dad of a young, a young girl named Sophie Cruz, six years old, Sophie Cruz, the best activist we have in this country, who I hope will run for president someday. Um, some people will call her an anchor baby. I call her an American. Her parents came here from Mexico a decade ago in search of a better opportunity. And now this young woman is advocating for her parents. Um, Maria Elena um, sat me next to Sophie and her mom inside the chamber of the Supreme Court. By the way, if you have not been inside the high court while they're deliberating, I suggest you get in line and do it. Um, I told Megyn Kelly on Fox News, because I only do Fox News these days, I told Megyn Kelly that it was the most American experience I've ever had, was sitting inside that court, listening to the justices debate and argue, kind of the intellectual rigor that is lacking in so much of our conversation, CC Donald Trump. Um, and sitting there amongst, what, 25, 26 undocumented immigrants, I was sitting next to Sophie Cruz, who was taking notes. She had written down the names of every single one of the justices, and she asked me who they, they wanted me, she wanted me to point out who was who. So I carried her a little bit up, and I was telling her, that's Clarence Thomas, he doesn't say anything. <laughs> Although apparently Clarence Thomas really moves around a lot, actually in his chair. I pointed out John Roberts, the Chief Justice, and then she said, you know, what do we need to win? Can't be split, Sophie. Um, you know, 6-2, 5-3 maybe, you know. And she said, well, you know, I really hope it goes our way, <laughs> the six-year-old says. And then she looks at her mom, who smiles at her. That's what immigration is about. This is what the Supreme Court case is about. You know, it's not immigration reform, it's certainly not amnesty, but it's absolutely in the step in the right direction. And when we ask this question of will the U.S. Supreme Court decision echo in November, absolutely yes. And all those people who have come out are not going to come back in some closet. And I don't know what else we have to do to convince you that we are one of you, that we are amongst you. And we, the undocumented immigrants of this country, as far as I'm concerned, define American. Thank you for having me here. Join me up here. It does not matter. I have, this is my assigned seat, but you guys can sit where you would like. All right, terrific remarks, my friend. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This is the coolest panel ever. Mm -hmm. Not only are you guys all my friends, but you are all also not born in the United States. This is our first panel, I think, of all. I know. I am the outlier of just being a daughter of immigrants, and I love it. So I'm going to do just a really, really quick round of introductions and then just tell the audience a little bit about what the format's going to be, and then we're just going to dive right in. So Jose Antonio Vargas has been introduced. 
Marielena Inca Page, you are the executive director of the National Immigration Law Center, a native of Colombia. My father's from Colombia. And um, your organization has really been at the heart of the Supreme Court advocacy. So thank you so much for being here. Mi Mao, the President and Executive Director of the Asian, American, uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice. I never get the letter, the order right of the words. You were born in Laos, wonderful. And um, you really are the heart and soul of the Asian community when it comes to like telling us what, what it is that we need to know. So looking forward to hearing so much more from you today. Um, Mario Carillo, you are the Communications Director of Voto Latino Action Network and you were born in Mexico. And thank you very much for being here. Um, all right, guys, so we're going to just dive right in. I'm going to ask a few questions, but I really want this to be conversation style, very relaxed, very casual. You may curse. I know I will. <laughs> um, and feel free to interrupt and jump in with other questions, all right? But let's just do like a little bit of just level setting in terms of the case, since that's at the heart of what we're talking about. Marielena, can you just tell us just wh what are the possible outcomes? And then you've been spearheading so much of the advocacy around it. And how has it been trying to get the community involved in doing that advocacy? Sure. So thanks again to everybody and to Cap Action Fund for organizing. I'm so privileged to be in the first immigrant panel. <laughs> this is fun? hopefully the first of many, many, many to come. Um, so a, a couple of things. One is I'll start with the victory because I'm an optimist by heart. Um, so one possibility is we win. Um, and as Jose mentioned, we need a majority vote. So you know, whether that's 5-3 or 6-2. What that means is that um, once the injunction is lifted, then the administration will have the green light to start the implementation program and friends and colleagues like Jose Antonio can come forward and finally get that piece of paper um, that um, will allow them to be re reunited with their families or to remain here with their families and to live with dignity. Um, if we get a 4-4 vote, um, that means that it's not a decision. Basically, they've punted because they lack a ninth justice Justice, and which is again a reminder of the importance of judicial nominations. Um, that means a 4-4 vote. The Fifth Circuit decision, uh, which has blocked the implementation of these programs, remains in place. And so we will be calling on the Department of Justice to immediately seek rehearing so that once there is a ninth justice, we can go back to the Supreme Court. And um, we're confident that the law is on our side, so we just need a majority vote, whether it's eight justices or nine justices. Um, and then, of course, there is a possibility of a loss altogether. But again, Again, we at the National Immigration Law Center and legal scholars across the country believe that the president acted with full legal authority, and so that's really not a scenario that we're paying too much um, attention to. And then your second question, Angie, was... Had, how has it been engaging the community? I, you've, you've gotten the advocates very well organized. Everybody has either filed or signed an amicus brief. Yes. Um, but tell us, how has it been engaging the community around a court case? Yeah. So I think what's interesting is, as Jose mentioned, right, one of the things that, I mean, the Supreme Court makes decisions that impacts every single person's life in this country and beyond. Um, and what's hard is that the legal profession, the legal system is so disempowering. And, and especially for people who are aspiring Americans, who are undocumented, who may not speak the language, who may not be familiar with our legal system as a whole, and frankly, for communities of color, for other disenfranchised communities. So that, that, the Supreme Court seems so foreign. In the immigrant community, we've had families who have been organizing courageously for immigration reform, for driver's licenses, for in-state tuition against deportations, and they're used to going to their policymakers, to the local, to the local elected officials, to governors, to Congress people. What they're not used to is engaging the courts or the Supreme Court. And so, one of the so on the one hand, it's been a challenge. On the other hand, the opportunity that it's created has really been a, a civics lesson. Um, I mean, to have people understand the importance of a Supreme Court decision and to connect it to the elections and to know, especially with this election, how much is at stake um, is really incredible. And I think a testament to that was that on April 18th, the day of oral arguments, we had a over 5,000 people who came from 26 states across the country, one of the largest mobilizations at an oral argument before the Supreme Court, representing the diversity of our families and our communities across the country. So very exciting. And as Jose mentioned, we made a very ex intentional decision. We had advocates lining up all weekend to save a spot for directly affected individuals so that they, we could have as many undocumented immigrants in the courtroom. And as someone who was sitting in the front row right behind the Department of Justice and Solicitor General, Generals, um, it was wonderful to see Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, uh, Ruth Ginsburg, 
um, even the just Chief Justice Kennedy looking across the room and for the first time seeing so many faces of parents, of children like Sophie in the courtroom knowing, I have no doubt that they were very conscious that their decision would affect those human beings in the room. So that was really um, history in the making. Um, so very, uh, a very powerful day and I think a day that, as Jose has mentioned, um, we'll, we'll all remember for quite a long time. Um, let's move to the smaller in number but ever mighty AAPI community. Um, and me, how has it been engaging them around this issue? Are there any challenges that you see different from other issues? Just talk to us a little bit about the community. I think that in the Asian American community, one of the challenges for our community, and you've heard um, Jose talk about uh, the numbers and the statistics, right? I mean, if you look at those who are um, potentially eligible to receive the ben benefits of DACA and DAPA, I believe more than one out of every 10 uh, of people who are eligible for both expanded DACA and DAPA are Asian Americans. And yet in the public discourse, right, um, there is not a, um, an understanding that the Asian American community is that deeply invested uh, in this conversation. Um, and so in a lot of ways for our community, we know that this um, tremendous, uh, uh, this has a tremendous impact on our communities. Um, and yet, um, I feel like there isn't the political um, will. And you know, we do um, a lot of work with, um, as a national organization, we do a lot of work and we partner with local Asian American organizations to, um, uh, as part of a DACA collaborative to do outreach and direct services to people on the ground. And so what we hear report back from our partners is that, one, you know, people who are currently eligible for the current DACA program um, are really scared, right? They're really scared. One, because they feel like there's not a, a, a political will, there's not a political space to protect Asian Americans who come out. That if you look at powerful people, that there are powerful people who've actually created a space to create a safe space for the Latino community to come out and that if something were to happen to them, there are political people, powerful people who will somehow protect them or own them. But Asian Americans feel really vulnerable that there's not that powerful political space to give them that safe space to come out. And so that makes it really hard. And then what we're hearing from a lot of um, our partners on the ground is that they don't have the resources. So you look at the gap of people who feel like they could actually take advantage of these kind of benefits. The gap between being eligible and the belief that you can actually do it is so big. And you measure that against the resources that are available to our nonprofits and our partners on the ground to actually do those kind of hearts and minds, you know, kind of work. Not even just filling out the application, but you have to really persuade <coughs> people that they have a stake in this. So I feel like those, those double barriers um, have made it really hard for the people in our community who deserve to be part of or have access to these solutions to come out. And then the other thing is that this court decision has thrown in a really weird, you know, uncertainty, right? Unsafe uncertainty to this. So how do I go out and say, be ready, apply for DACA, prepare yourself, be ready, but then there's this court case, right? So why would people self-identify, and I think Jose can speak to this, and put themselves in a vulnerable position when there is so much uncertainty about whether or not this will even become law. Mm -hmm. and we're going to get into that um, in a lot of detail. But um, from the perspective, Mario of Voto Latino, you guys have done a lot in terms of community engagement. You're, you guys are terrific in social media. You've got a lot of reach, right? right. So win or lose, and I, I believe we're going to win, <laughs> um, what's going to be the effect in terms of engaging people and getting them registered to vote? Sure, and thank you very much for having me here, by the way. And I think in terms of the Latino vote this year, we are living in a very interesting time, and I think we've already touched upon several of the, of the things that we're currently living through. Number one being a decision that's going to impact millions of immigrants. Many of them are obviously Latino. And we also have a campaign that began almost a year ago exactly, and it began by calling Mexican immigrants, so people like myself, people like my parents, rapists and criminals, and I think when you add those two, we're at the confluence of things that are really engaging the Latino community. So we have, I believe, Latino engagement unlike we've ever seen before. We've seen number of voter registrations increase. We've seen the number of people who have become U.S. citizens increase, all because they understand the importance that is playing out in 2016, right? So I think when we look at it that way, 
Um, we, we know that what happens this year is going to have a great impact on our communities. But going back to your question on this decision, and I think for Voto Latino, we look at this case, however it goes, and I'm with you that I feel like we're going to win, and I hope that we do, but it doesn't change our overall message of making sure that everyone turns out in November, right? I think that if, if we win, then we know that to keep the victory, we, we essentially know what we have to do, right? Because one candidate has said that they will immediately undo this program and also the original DACA program, which protects um, more than 700,000 people. And, and if, un if we get an unfortunate decision either on Thursday or on Monday, then I feel that we know a lot of work is left to be done. All right, I'm gonna, I really wanna get into the effect of Trump, let's just say it out loud, um, <laughs> on, the, on the program, but let's just do a little bit more level setting. So Jose, Rate, rate the media. I mean, how, <laughs> right. Um, I mean, they, God, they, it's so sad, they, yeah. they, 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 they play a super important role in shaping the narrative um, in Spanish language press, which I know you're not following, but <laughs> in English language press to the average American person. And when, so when you watch it, like, do you want to throttle the throats of some of your colleagues in the journalism world of journalism or do you feel like they're doing an okay job i'm like just just oh, rate the media it's almost maybe a d bordering on an f okay um, that's so good right they didn't and but i mean you know but you have to distinguish of course between television media and print media okay right i mean i think there are some reporters and editors who are trying to do a better job in contextualizing but this is where donald trump you know absence information Absent the information, absent the context, Donald Trump rises, right? He can get away with what he can get away with because most people don't know that not only is he spewing lies and factless accusations, but there is actually no ground on which he's speaking of as, he, as, as it really relates on immigration, right? Um, what I'm astounded by is, you know, I actually have to wonder, you know, when you have news organizations like the Washington Post and the New York Times still using the word illegal to refer to people, are they actually then intentionally siding with Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. That's a question that I would love to ask yeah. every editor, yeah. you know, who works in newsrooms across. Yeah. This is now, when we look back, you know, 30, 40 years from now, I think unmistakably the media will get a big blunt of the blame when it comes to how can we have missed not only immigration reform, which is, you know, that thing, but immigration in general, mm -hmm. right? 55% uh, of the total U.S. population growth in this country in the past 50 years had come from Latinos and Asians, 55%. In the next 50 years, 88% of the total population growth in this country are going to come from mostly Latinos and Asians, most of whom know somebody who's undocumented. That's a big story that the news media in general haven't been able to tell. Why? As I'm sitting here, I can't really think of many Latinos or Asian editors in power, in positions of power in newsrooms across this country. May it be the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN, mm -hmm. Politico, <clears throat> right? Um, that's why the issue is as quote unquote ghettoized as it is. And as a journalist myself, I am, I am um, heartbroken uh, just the irresponsibility. Um, the fact that people don't even know. One, one, one quick thing about this. People forget that the, this suit from Texas started because Texas didn't want to have to pay for driver's licenses, right? right? There are 1.8 million undocumented immigrants in the state of Texas. Anybody here from Texas? Does Texas have a subway system or a bus system? How are these 1.8 million undocumented Texans getting around? Of course they're driving, of course right? They're. Of course they are. Half of, half of the construction business in the state of Texas are from undocumented Texans, right? And yet the assumption is that these undocumented immigrants are a drain to society. We're not even talking about the factual information that they contribute billions of dollars in taxes. I live in the state of California, one of 12 states that allow us to <clears> drive. <throat> I just got my first car. Mm -hmm. I just signed up for a triple A insurance. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you take a driver's ed? <laughs> yes, I did. I'm actually doing pretty well. Okay, good. I'm not a living. We've had some driving know. issues. We know. <laughs> we'll go back. Yes. We have <laughs> but can you imagine how many more right. billions of dollars the insurance companies and car dealerships will make if undocumented people can actually drive? 
Why aren't we talking about that? That's right. Good but, point. Yeah. All right, me. I want to pick up on something that Jose just said that relates to the first comment you were making about n feeling like there's not people in positions of power that have the community's back, okay. right? And you're pointing to how that plays out in terms of how the media reports it. You're, you're connecting it to people's fear and going forward, right? Okay, so you are like one of the top leading voices for the Asian community. How, what do you do to draw people out? How do you get them to gain confidence? What do you say? Well, you know, I, I'm really proud, and I think that Maria Elena and others on this um, panel can, will probably echo with me that actually the ethnic press and ethnic media has been right. really good to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they understand because they're part of our community. Mm -hmm. They live in our communities. They, they themselves have family members who are affected by this. And so we have been really um, um, uh, intentional about getting information to our ethnic media and ethnic presses. Um, and we've been taking advantage of the, the um, uh, the numerous community-based organizations uh, that are part of our collective network, not just nonprofit organizations, but the faith uh, community, temples and mosques and churches, um, as well as health clinics and I mean places where our people's lives touch. We've used those as the informal outlets, right, to get the information out there. But at the end of the day, we can get the information to our people. We can say to them, this is an opportunity. Don't be afraid. Come out. We can host clinics, right? We can host um, uh, informational session. Um, but unless and until people feel that there is that surety of safety there, people will hesitate to come. And I can tell you that there have been experiments in California when Congressman Honda or Congresswoman Judy Chu or Congressman Mark Takano has actually hosted a community town hall meeting to talk about this and then we pair it with a workshop, right? We see the numbers for uh, the current DACA program escalate. But absent those kind of leadership voices to say it's okay and putting that kind of political muscle and power behind it, our people are afraid. And, and you know, what I fear is that given how many days we have left in this administration and given the kind of political rhetoric that we have heard, that, that even if the decision went our way, right, we're all going to have to really bust our butts to get to our people to say, please, please come out. And the question is, will we have the resources to accelerate the pace that we need to be accelerating to make sure that every single person who deserves right, this opportunity are able to take advantage of it? That feeds in actually to my very next question. So, Marilena, you're thinking about not just decision day, but the next day, right? We're going to win and then this puppy is going to need to be implemented, and we've got the days just, you know, uh, diminishing of this administration while the political rhetoric heat goes up. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what's the strategy when people are hearing the hateful spew um, from particularly the presidential candidate on the Republican side, but also from other leaders, let's be honest, uh, and, and that may keep people from applying. Like, what do you say when people say, Who's going to come forward? Why would I take that chance? Yep. Like, how do you? Because I get asked that by the press. So, give me my talking points. What do I say? <laughs> yeah. So it's a very important question. So first, what's the strategy? First, we're going to celebrate, right? Yeah. Oh, we yeah. win. We're the good victory at that was fought for and won by immigrants themselves. This is not just on immigration. Like on any public policy issue, to have the very people directly impacted be the ones who courageously organize and achieve that victory. That is huge for democracy. So first, we need to stop and celebrate every victory, small or big. We celebrate it. Second, we roll up our sleeves right away. And I think doing some of what me was talking about, which is we have to go into implementation mode immediately. Four years ago, when we were able to celebrate DACA on June 15th, the next morning, the United We Dream Network, NILC, AILA, our American Immigration Lawyers Association, and a number of small allies, we met the entire weekend to map out a full-on strategy for implementation. We're already doing that as well, right? So we have a larger network of legal service providers, of direct service for unions, schools, right? Just we need every part of society engaged to get this implemented. Of course, we need the administration to move quickly for implementation as swiftly as possible so that we can get these programs up and running. Um, the DACA Plus program or the expanded DACA program for which Jose would be eligible for, for which Cerise Rice, a Trinidadian woman from Florida who I had the honor of meeting at the first, at the historic Undocu Black convening, right? First time ever undocumented immigrants and black immigrants coming together um, who are the bridge between our Black Lives Movement and immigrant justice movement coming together to say, 
we're going, we don't have a space. We've been invisible, right? And we need to come out. Sharice now has come out. She was at the steps of the Supreme Court. We have a beautiful video where she tells her story. People like Sharice are ready to come out and apply. So part of it is what we tell people, yes, of course, the anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-woman, anti-everyone, it seems like except Trump himself, um, rhetoric definitely is impacting people. And we have a responsibility to make sure that the community understands the pros and cons. What are the risks and benefits? And at the end of the day, it's an individual decision. It's a personal decision about whether they are ready to come out and apply or not. Because this was fought for and won by courageous immigrants themselves, d domestic worker moms, day laborers, people who are, have been here for many, many years, they're going to be the first ones to come forward, right? So I, I often point to DACA as the blueprint for this. In 2012, folks might remember, almost the same timeline, DACA was announced in June of 2012. It went into in, in, uh, implementation, began in August of 2012. And the rhetoric at that time, the candidate was Mitt Romney, and he was talking about self-deportation. Now, self-deportation today sounds mild, given what we're hearing about. But frankly, in 2012, that was a scary period as well. And many people also wondered whether or not to come forward. But the fact is that the organizing and the activists themselves, our young immigrant leaders who again were the ones who fought for and achieved DACA immediately applied and in fact the August September October peak that was the largest group of people coming forward to apply for DACA so I think that we're going to see something very similar this time around we're gonna have the mothers that were outside fasting outside of the Supreme Court who've been fasting for DAPA they're gonna be the first ones coming forward to apply as well That's great. Yeah. Oh, so exciting yeah. <laughs> um, so Mario Something that I get asked about is, and I just want to know how you answer this question is, but doesn't the Latino community care about all issues? The economy, <laughs> health care, education, you know, why, why the um, overly intense focus on immigration? How do you answer that? Well, I think, first of all, for Latinos, we understand that the issue of immigration is one that's very personal, right? So the Latino, I mean, the uh, immigrant community is made up predominantly of Latinos. So for us, even for someone like myself, who's a citizen, and for my parents are now uh, citizens as well, even, even so, I have so many friends. I, I know so many people through the work that I've done with Voto Latino and with United We Dream as well, who are very close to me. And I want to see them also have those opportunities that I've had as well. So even though the issue of immigration doesn't affect me personally, it does affect a lot of people who I love. And that, I think that goes the same for all of us up here, right? So, but with that said, I think one of the things that we have struggled with is how to kind of break out of that mold that we only care about immigration, right? And I think that's one of the things that Voto Latino has really tried to do is we, our audience is not made up entirely of undocumented young people. It's made up of citizens as well, but a lot of them come from mixed status families. And we understand that they care about the same issues that other young Americans care about. They want access to education. They want access to choice. They, they want their parents to have opportunities as well, right? So I think one of the things that we have to, to remember is that while immigration is very personal to us, we have to continually hone on the fact that, that we care about other issues as well. And I think that's one of the things that's been lacking in previous elections is that immigration, and I speak because the dreamers have taught me so much, mm -hmm. it's gotten us so far as a movement, as a community, but I feel that now on the issue of immigration, there's still some work to be done, but now we have to start talking about the intersectionality that Marilena was talking about. So I, I would love for the black community, for the Asian community, for the Latino community, for all of us to, com to come together and to understand that my struggle is the same as anyone else's, right? So I think until we can have those conversations, frankly, and understanding that, that all our, our issues are connected, uh, we're still gonna have a lot of work to do. Let me, can I just yeah, add please. to this? I, I think the other thing here too is, I don't wanna keep harping on the media, but, Whenever people write about immigration, they automatically go yes. to Latinos right. yes. um, and Mexicans, yeah. exactly. right? Yes. Like I have, I have to tell you, so at Define American, we've done more than 750 events in 48 states in the past five years. So I've been really traveling nonstop. Oh, yeah. um, maybe at least 30 or so Tea Party meetings, mm -hmm. right? Like really trying to engage people. It is even more important now that if you're not Mexican, that you call out when people like your own family members <laughs> and friends and coworkers say something bad about Mexicans, yes. which when I was in Alabama, Arkansas, Wisconsin, Mexican is synonymous with illegal, right? As if all of that, and you know, this is one thing that people don't understand is in this country, the fastest growing immigrant population are Asians. Almost 72% of all Asian adults in America are immigrants. Asians are more immigrants than Latinos are immigrants. <laughs> and yet, because the media doesn't know what to do, 
-hmm. right? And because when they think immigration, they go to the Latino people, the Latinos, like Asians get completely lost. As, as we're sitting here, actually, I want to make a pledge. How do we get Asian, you know, you can't swing a person in DC and not hit a journalist, mm -hmm. right? Like, how can we get Asian American <laughs> journalists to step up and cover this issue? I have to say the Asian American Journalism Association hasn't done enough when it comes to really covering this issue and providing much needed context. And we would love to figure out a way to do great that. Great idea, do a round and, you know, table. Yep. That's a great, great, great idea. Um, okay, so back to, you guys have like go, gone through my questions and more. I'm so incredibly thrilled. Um, all right, so Marilena, the other topic that often comes up is about legislation because um, we're going to win in the Supreme Court, but what we're going to win, let's, let's be honest, yes, yes. is at most a tolerated presence for the five million people, right? It is not a green card. It is not the ability to vote. You cannot become a citizen from deferred action. Um, and it's only for a couple of years, right? And we're going to go back through this again at the next election. So when how do we get more lasting change what's it going to take um, in terms of legislation and and what what have, and is there going to be the political will really important question <laughs> so yes i think just um again to remind people the daca program um, which currently exists and is not being challenged individuals have a two-year protection and it's renewable so people are now on their fourth year for some of them um, the the new programs hopefully once the supreme court allows them to go forward people will be able to have that temporary protection for three years along with work authorization so they're extremely important and look the reality is we needed those programs and we advocated for them because the deportation rates were completely off the charts and people People were afraid. So there's, it's temporary, but essential because it's really about the ability for people to remain with their family members, for Sophie not to be worried, for her just to, a six year old to focus on her education and not be worried about whether her mother is going to be there at the end of the day or whether she's going to be picked up by immigration agents. So, um, so all of that necessary, but absolutely we need long-term fixes and that includes re immigration reform right federal legislative reform and that is uh, there's from our perspective at the national immigration law center we are at a place where we have to really reimagine what immigration reforms look like and that's both legislative fixes administrative fixes at the federal level but there is a ton that we can do at the state and local level as well because immigration i think as jose was talking about earlier it's not just about that piece of paper right it's about how can people live with dignity how can people live and earn a living wage and not be retaliated on the job because they're undocumented and they're trying to exercise their rights and join a union or organize a union? How could a, you know, someone who is a victim of domestic violence, a survivor, be able to come forward? So there's a, a ton of things that we need to do at the state and local level to help people improve their lives on a daily basis in conjunction with legislative and administrative reform. But we need long-term solutions for sure. Yeah, I'm going to go to you, your former state elected leader. Go. Well, um, Angie, I think that the, the best solution to create the conditions for us to be able to bring about the permanent solutions is that we have to make sure our communities go out and vote. And that we know, I know every election year people say it's the most critical year, but <laughs> seriously, I mean, we have to go out and vote. Um, we just completed a survey of Asian American voters. And an overwhelming majority of Asian American voters said that they will change their vote based on the anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim hate um, rhetoric that's being perpetuated by the candidates that they're looking at. Mm -hmm. So we need to, to, to understand this, we need to harness this, and, and I'm just saying that if candidates, um, whether at the local level or at the national level, if they're looking for Asian American voters, they better know that our community be, will be watching the kind of rhetoric that they will be pushing out, and our communities will vote based on what they're saying about the most vulnerable in our community. And so we need to be the messengers to get people to go out and vote. We cannot allow the negativity to keep our people at home, because that's how we won't get to a permanent solution. Yep. If I yes, may add, I know that in 2016 we're likely to see a record number of Latinos turn up to vote. I mean, I'm not going to guess what that number is going to be, but it's very likely to be a number that we've never seen before. But I want the community to really understand is that while we still can elect who's going to be president, 
we will elect who sits on our city halls. We will right. elect who sits That's on our right. school boards, who sits in our governor's mansions, right? So I, I think once we start capitalizing on that power that our community has been building, will the numbers in 2018, which is not a general, will we be able to break record numbers then again? So I think when we start looking at the election, we talk about the presidential one a lot, but what Voto Latino has been really trying to do is really try to harness that power that we've been building and to continue uh, affecting elections at the local level as well, which would really make some change. Yeah, and Angie, if I could just yeah, add, because sure. I think a lot of it is about political power, right? We haven't achieved federal legislative reform because we haven't had the political power, in addition to a dysfunctional Congress and a couple of other problems um, in D.C. But I think it is about building that political power over the next years to be able to achieve the kind of immigration reform that our communities and our country deserves and needs desperately. I think the other piece just because by focusing on the presidential elections, I mean, the Senate is at stake, yep. the House of Representatives is at stake, and also it's not just about who the president is for the next four years, but going back to the Supreme Court and the importance of judicial nominations, I mean, we have the opportunity to, for the next president to nominate maybe two, maybe three justices that will impact this country and our lives and the type of society, society that we live in for generations, for decades to come. So I do think, I know we always say this is a really consequential, consequential election, but 2016 absolutely is. All so right, much at so stake. One more question about turnout, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. So the way I, the way I experience and, and what I say when people talk about Trump and isn't he going to just ensure that there will be greater people, numbers of people turning out to vote? Like, isn't it just like a lock? I'm like, mm, I'm not so sure, because his craziness can get up here. But that doesn't mean that the support for the other candidates is necessarily going to be sure. commensurate with that, right? I think it creates an opening, but you have to have a, a Democratic presidential candidate who's going to like lean into it. Right. So I want to know, do you guys agree with that analysis? And if you do, what does she need to do? What does the Democratic establishment need to do? Like that. <laughs> Isn't that kind of cool? She, um, <laughs> I love saying that. Mm -hmm. um, but no, just, but, and do, or do you agree with my analysis? Or do you think that the fear and the, just the vitriol is going to be enough to get people to turn out? Let me just say, by the way, I made a documentary. I'll let each of you answer that and then we'll. Okay. I made a documentary for MTV called White People last summer because I wanted to ask white people where they were from, how did you get here, who paid, right? <laughs> Until you recognize that you're immigrants yourselves, like how are you gonna connect with this issue, right? Mm -hmm. And given the fact that the political media did not think Trump was gonna get this nomination, mm -hmm. I don't trust these surveys and these polls at all. Yeah. And I used to cover political politics, so like, I mean, presidential politics. So I will not underestimate the level of anxiety, anger, mm -hmm. insecurity, of a lot of lower middle class, middle class white voters all across this country. Think about it, this country is only gonna get gayer, right? More gay people will come out. <laughs> gayer, blacker, browner, <laughs> more Asian, like <laughs> right? Gayer, blacker, browner, more Asian. Women of all backgrounds will break every barrier there is to break. What's at stake in the election? In some ways, what's at stake is how much change can white heterosexual men handle? Right. Clearly, if you're Donald Trump, not a lot, right? So how do we, how, I mean, I, I, I don't want to like, I, 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 it's really important that Asian and, and, and Latino voters, and you know, if I could, if I had one wish, man, I wish every undocumented immigrant in this country got a citizen and say, please vote because I can't, yeah. right. right? If yeah. we could do that, that would be awesome. Yeah. But we cannot underestimate the level of, of anxiety and just, you know, fear you know, that middle class, lower middle class, all white people feel in this country, which is not to say that all white people feel this way. You know, clearly we have progressive white allies who are with us. But, yeah, I think we should keep that in mind. Well, and you can feel economic anxiety oh without being gosh. racist, right? I mean, that's, course, that's legitimate yes, given that absolutely. income inequality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Marielena, what's your answer to the question? Yeah, so agree completely. I think, look, I, I think one of the challenges that we have right now in this country is the siloing and the fact that the poor, like the, the working class white males that you're referring to, Jose, are going towards one particular candidate because they feel like no one is speaking for them and looking out for their interests. And look, there's a lot of economic pain in this country, yes. regardless what color you are, regardless of whether you're a citizen or not. And all we need candidates who are actually speaking to, and not just speaking to, but coming up with policy solutions that are based and grounded in economic justice that lift the floor for everyone in our country. And I think we as immigrants have a responsibility to make sure that we're reaching out and talking to those U.S. white male workers who feel like they are 
you know, becoming invisible and are afraid of losing some mm -hmm. kind of control, this romantic, nostalgic idea of what the United States used to be like. So that's one piece on the economic justice piece. But I think, look, hate, anger, fear are definitely mobilizers. They mobilize people, but hope, hope is something in vision that inspires people to come out to vote. And I think that's where I do get concerned about whether there are enough people out there who are equally afraid of one candidate and equally inspired and excited and hopeful about what the future holds. And I think that will really end up determining. I, I'm a true believer in, in inspiring and vision and hope for our country and painting a vision that everyone can get behind. Well, you know, I'm going to um, channel my former self as an elected official <laughs> who uh, ran many, many campaigns. And let me tell you that the hate mongering on the right cannot be the left's sole strategy right. to win in this right. election cycle. Mm -hmm. The hate mongering cannot be the sole strategy. And, and the reason I say that is because every election cycle we have this conversation. And I think what we are seeing is that our friends on the left think that by letting the hate continue to perpetuate, that somehow that would drive our people to a winning strategy. That ain't the winning strategy. Right. In, in, in our survey that we recently re released with Asian American voters, you know, over 62% of Asian American voters have yet to be contacted by the Democratic Party. And over 74% of Asian American voters have yet to be contacted by the Republican Party. So neither parties are paying attention to us as a community as part of their base, right? And so when you look at the resources that are being invested both by the political parties as well as by their candidates to do outreach to our community in an affirmative, an affirmative way to say, we're selling you our vision, we're selling you hope, we're selling you what we could do for you, they're not making any effort whatsoever to do that. So yes, while hate mongering may, may help tick up the number only to a certain point, that's not building democracy. That's not about building a voter base. It's not about building power. The question I would put before all of us is, you know, are either side of the aisle actually, you know, do either of them have the wisdom or the fortitude to see the demographic reality? Because anybody who ignores these demo demographic realities will do so at their own peril. And we're going to see it this year, and we'll see it in 2018, and for sure we'll see it in 2020. <laughs> I'll, I'll say these two things about Donald Trump's campaign, and I think the number one thing is that it's a strategy that's reliant on people not showing up. You can't run a campaign that demonizes, that dehumanizes entire communities. When you call in a Muslim ban for the entire world, you're alienating more people. And then when you call on immigration and building walls, you're, you're relying on an electorate that's continually shrinking. And I know there's going to be a lot of white anger that might lead to a higher voter turnout among the white community, but it's still a shrinking electorate, and that cannot be denied. And if you look at his unfavorables with these communities, you have to wonder, is that strategy going to work? Now, I, going back to your point, I'm not sure if that's enough. And I think that as Latino communities have done in the past, we don't vote for parties. We vote for communities, we vote for families, we vote for candidates and policies that we think will better our opportunities. Obviously, the Republican side has made that a little bit more skewed over the last couple of elections, going to self-deportation, going to what's happening today. But in an absence of a candidate that's aspiring enough to get Latinos out to vote, I'm not sure if the hatred and the fear is enough to get us there where we have to go. That's right, that's right. All right, I have been very greedy and selfish and been monopolizing you all. So let's see if folks in the audience have any questions. Um, the lady in, way in the back. Um, oh, there's a mic. Thank you to this wonderful panel and for all the great work your organizations do. My name is Rochelle Friedman. I'm with the Coalition on Human Needs. I wanted to ask you to comment on the reality or the lack thereof of articles that come out. They tend to be articles that talk about DACA or DAPA or something, um, uh, getting green cards or whatever. And then the articles say, but you know, the Latinos who have been here, who came through the door the right way and who are citizens, they're not in agreement with some of this. It's sort of an effort, it feels to me like, to split the Latino community, and I just wondered if uh, you know if you you'd comment on that. 
Great question. So they came in the right way yeah. argument. Yeah. Who wants to take that one? Sure, I'm one of those that came in the right way. The reality is that if my family were trying to come today, we would not be able to. The immigration system hasn't kept up. It's completely outdated. And so, yes, I agree completely, Rochelle, and thank you for the Coalition for Human Needs. Excellent work on economic justice. Um, I think what's the problem is that there, the strategy on the right has is all about divide and conquer right whether it's among latinos the documented and undocumented whether it's against asians, asian pacific islanders and latinos whether it's black and latinos i mean there's so many ways we're constantly trying to be divided and i think it's important for our communities and i think that is one of the places where the ethnic media does a very good job of educating communities and yes of course there are some people out there who are first second generation who may say that but overwhelmingly the polls show that the majority of immigrants, even those who came in the right way, like my family, are completely supportive because 85% of mixed status families, are, of immigrant families, live in a mixed status family. That means you have a citizen, you have an undocumented member, we have, we have many, many different status. So I, I do think it's, it happens a lot, but it completely mis, misinformation. All right, um, the young lady over there to the left. Hi, I'm Abigail Woodward. I'm just a concerned citizen. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, I think it's really important that the U.S. Uh, admit how much they rely on the labor of undocumented immigrants. And I would like to point out that they don't put any kind of uh, restriction on the uh, inflow and outflow of capital. So we don't see any, uh, any tax on that kind of a flow. And the other thing is, um, I'm a strong union uh, supporter, and I can see that there could be uh, difficulties and support coming from the union. So what would y'all like to say about that? Um, anybody? I'm I, I think that in the last go round, um, granted, I mean, there's history and in the past, I think there's been ambiguity where our union brothers and sisters are in terms of immigration reform. But in the last go round, um, I think that our, uh, the, the union family has been firmly behind. In fact, sometimes leading because they have the credibility to speak where people who look like us don't have the credibility. And they've been really strong partners leading the conversation and really leading the fight and putting both their resources and their networks on the ground to, to get to and to leverage the people sitting on the hill to think differently about how they have to fix this broken system. But let me oh, just, the other thing I want to add though is, again, this is where information is so important, right? So Vice News interviewed the chief actuary of the Social Security Administration two years ago, who said on record that undocumented workers like us have contributed $100 billion into the Social Security Fund in the past decade. 12 right? billion a year. 12 billion a year. I actually got a letter from the Social Security people telling me that I've contributed $180,000. Now, I don't know how the Social Security Administration know where I am <laughs> and that I've contributed this money, and yet a few blocks away, the Department of Homeland Security want to deport us. I don't know if you know about ITIN numbers. You should Google that, right? The IRS comes up with an ITIN number to say, hey, you're here illegally, okay, keep paying taxes. And yet DHS, right? So in absence of all of these kind of, people don't even know that this exists. I can't tell you, if you actually go on my Twitter page, I have a pinned tweet of a check that I wrote to the Department of Treasury of taxes, right? just to kind of make sure that we're debunking this idea that we're not contributing. I think the American people in general are in denial about this. I think Frank Sherry likes to say, you know, we put a sign out of the U.S.-Mexico border that says, keep out, 10 yards in, what do we say? Help wanted. Yeah, yeah that's right. Right? You can't have it both ways. Yeah. You can't, like, want cheap labor, which this country was built on. Talk to black people about that, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, want to kick us out. Yeah. Yeah, and if I could just add, because I think it's a really important question. I mean, immigration and, and workers have been seen as a commodity, frankly, right, throughout history, whether we're talking about forced migration like slaves or whether it's immigrants, et cetera. And so unions actually are a very strong ally for us. I mean, American Federation of Teachers is in the front row. Um, SCIU, United Food and Commercial Workers, the Laborers Union, AFL-CIO, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Some of our strongest allies, because we know that at the end of the day, 
immigrant rights are workers' rights. And it's about, again, lifting up the power. How do we give workers, regardless of their immigration status, the ability to organize unions, the ability to elect a union, the ability to be active members in their workforce to improve working conditions for everyone? It lifts up the floor. And in fact, undocumented immigrants, workers, have they act, employers hire them to re repress working right. conditions, right? So it's right. oftentimes the, the blame is on the worker when in fact it's the employers who are using it as a union busting tool. Great question. I just have time for a couple more. The gentleman in the front row, and then I'll get to you. Hi. Um, my name is Juan Antonio Solis. I'm still a student, but I'm working with the Raven Group over the summer. Um, and while I know this, this is much more than just a, a Supreme Court case, there's no going around the fact that there's also a legal battle um, that's part of this. And um, I, I know Judge Hainan, the judge who lifted the or who placed the injunction and other judges in the Southern District Court of Texas and in my conversations with them um, many of whom are who uh, lean left politically and socially uh, many have come to the consensus that um, that this executive order essentially creates a new legal group of immigrants or a different kind of status for certain immigrants and so, so those are some of the legal concerns that they've raised so my question is uh, how is the u.s and how is the solicitor general framing this issue and the supreme court to get over the idea that this is just um, sort of trying to create a new group of immigrants I mean, so just very briefly, there's no creation of a new group whatsoever. What the administration has done is basically said that they have limited resources, they're using, they're get, they get to decide, and the federal, like there's Supreme Court decisions that say the federal government has a, the authority to decide how to use those limited resources. What the president did in 2012 and in 2014 is, okay, we're going to prioritize certain people and not others, and if they meet certain criteria, like parents of U.S. citizen children, they can come forward and apply for deferred action now, deferred action is something that exists in the regulation since the 1980s. Um, and so although the Texas lawsuit has, has focused on that, the fact is even during the Supreme Court arguments, the Texas Attorney General conceded that the president could provide deferred action. They now have issues with the work authorization, which also was something created in the 1980s. So absolutely no new creation of a, a new category or anything like that. No question, though. The young man in the front. I just wanted to go back a little bit to the um, 2008 campaign and how we're talking about the rhetoric that has been, you know, um, driven by some of our presidential um, candidates and how the hateful rhetoric is really uh, making the Asian, Black, Latino, and other minorities come out to vote. But at the same time, we need to have that hopeful rhetoric on the other side that energizes them to also continue and to build that on that on that ener energy and power. Um, we've already had that campaign of hope and of promise, where our presidential candidate w promised immigration reform on his first year in office. That was President Barack Obama, and we know that he what he delivered was two million deportations that you know could still continue to go on every single day. So how do we ensure that as we make people, as, uh, as we energize people to come out to vote for, um, for the Democratic Party, we make sure um, that we hold them accountable to what they are promising and why it is it that they are promising an immigration reform, right? So that's, what is your take on that? That's <laughs> a great last question. I'm gonna, every, everyone's going to answer that. Right? So we're saying come out and vote, and then how do we know that they're going to act in a way that actually supports the community? That is a million dollar question, right? And I think that in terms of President Obama, he has overseen the most deportations more than any other president, and we can't deny that fact, right? But I think we have to go back to the immigrant youth who have been able to keep him accountable, at least to provide some sort of executive action relief. And that didn't come because President Obama felt the need to do it, right? That, that came because of pressure uh, from people on the stage and from people like yourself. So that's the way that we can hold administrations accountable. And I know that in terms of the immigration reform talk in 2008, he made a very clear choice of not pursuing immigration reform, and that left a bad taste in the mouth of a lot of Latinos and a lot of immigrants generally. So I think that's, it's up to the next candidate, her, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's up to her, <laughs> to really uh, understand that Latinos have heard all of this before. But I think when you look at her campaign specifically, you can point to certain things that she's done that provide a, a, some hope, right? So if you look at some of the people that have been hired, some of the, the spokespeople for her campaign, you see someone like Lorela, who's a very close friend of mine, who, who speaks from the heart, who comes at the issue of immigration from such a personal point of view. And you, I, I, I'm with her, I'm with Lorela, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> when I think about this campaign, I think about the fact that uh, Lorela is someone who provides a voice to a lot of immigrant youth 
who then we will unfortunately have to hold her accountable as well at some point as well. So I, I think it, you're right that we can't let ourselves get our hopes high just to have them dashed again, but we have to continue holding these individuals accountable too. You know, um, in August, we're going to um, be a sponsor of an event that the um, uh, Asian Pacific American Vote and the Asian American Journal Association is going to um, do in Nevada uh, to try to bring out over 4,000 Asian American um, faith leaders, civic leaders, nonprofit leaders um, for a presidential town hall. We've never had presidential candidates address our community in the past. And so we're going to do this. And the reason why we felt it was really important to, to, to be a sponsor of this event is that um, we can't even get to our people holding people accountable when those people aren't even willing to talk to our people about what they want to do or hope to do, right? Um, so I, 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 I am not about uh, Democrats or Republicans. I'm about somebody who is going to take care of my community. You know, I am in this work not so that one political party could prevail, because believe me, from my past experiences as an elected official, I have fought many times with people of my own party, and sometimes I'm even more angry at them, you know, for, for their inability to have the courage to do what is right than the other side of the aisle. So, so this fight and this conversation, one, is about how do we get to our community, provide them um, with the information that they need to smartly um, and accurately go out there and, 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 and feel like their voices are being heard, but that, that, that's not where it ends. The winning of the election is only half a step of the process. The governance is an important piece, and we have to be relentless and vigilant in holding people accountable to what they say they will do. So from, from the seats up here, all I know is I'm working really hard and supporting all of my colleagues who are working on the ground to get to election day. But I think my biggest job actually starts the day after election when I head up to the hill and I start saying to people, now it's payback time. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. Look, <clears throat> yes, President Obama's first election was all about hope and change. And there has been disappointment. I mean, not only has he deported more than 2 million people, but we are celebrating World Refugee Today. World and refugee yet day. he is deporting Central American refugees, mothers who are fleeing gender violence, who are fleeing the highest levels of murder and femicide in this world. Um, but yet, this administration has decided to deport mothers and children back to violence and to rape and murder. Um, so absolutely, but look, this is what democracy is about. It's about being engaged in electing leaders that we think reflect our vision for this world, but it is about holding them accountable. And in fact, I would say we've done a pretty good job. If by the end of this administration, not only have we gotten health care and a number of other progressive policies, plus hopefully close to a million young immigrants like yourself who have DACA, and hopefully another five million or so who will be able to get temporary work authorization, that's because we held the president accountable. So I don't think the, you know, the writing is not done yet. There's still some months left. Hopefully, again, we'll win. But look, this is what exercising our political muscle is all about and doing so every single day, not just because there's a, a person running for an elected official, whether it's at the presidential level or at the local level. Our job as People who live in this country, people who live in this world, is to hold elected officials accountable at all levels, of all parties. I'm as much as political junkie as everybody here is, and we're in front of people at CAP, we're all political junkies. I just have to say, though, having traveled as much as I have, there is absolutely no moral clarity when it comes to this issue. Right? We are lost. Our conscience is lost when it comes to this issue. You know, we don't even see it as a moral imperative. Right. The fact that you had mentioned about, I mean, you know, I remembered, you know, when I ended up getting detained, I'm surrounded by the they separated the boys and the girls in the detention center, which is really a jail. And I'm sitting there next to these boys, you know, brown boys. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, man, if these kids had walked here from Canada. There would have been no way we would have put them in jail. Oprah would have showed up free Disneyland trips. Right? It would have been a humanitarian crisis of like gigantic proportions. But no, it's just a bunch of brown kids. Put them in jail. Right? In the same way that, again, the LGBT rights movement has, has whenever, as, as a gay man, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still astounded when people talk about, you know, gay, gay love and love, right? 
that that just happened in the past decade. I think here we have to figure out how do we make immigration about families, right? And what we do for each other. Um, so I think that for me is how do we hold ourselves accountable to that? I think that's right. This, this president reminds me of my first high school relationship where like, I love him, I hate him, I love him, I hate him. Um, and a lot of what has happened of the millions of people who've been deported, I hate him. Um, and these raids are despicable. Um, but there is a bit of a roadmap, right? And if the Supreme Court does what it should do, then we will have, as Maria Elena correctly points out, protected almost half of the undocumented population from deportation, right? I mean, times are changing. More undocumented people can drive. Students who grow up in a state can go to college and, and their parents pay the tuition that's in state, which I can tell you, paying college tuition right now, it's really expensive. So they are slowly changing, but it, we can't depend on just the people we elect. Yes, we have to hold them accountable. We have to make sure that they're surrounded by smart people like us, but it's up to us that we don't let them exhale without thinking about the fact that five-year-old children represent themselves in immigration court. Just, just Let's just think about that, bananas. right? Children yeah. don't have the right to an attorney, and it is a matter of shaming them. It's a matter of shame and hope. <laughs> That's right. And we That's can right. do both, yeah. right? That's right. So I want a big round of applause for the most extraordinary panel ever. Thank you all very much.